I would like to welcome you all to Our Women's Rights in Islam Compatible with the Modern Society, a very current topic which needs to be firmly discussed. Let me welcome Esteban gonzalez Pons, who will open the program. Just for those who don't know about Mr. Pons, he's an MEP from Spain. He's the first vice president of the EPP group in charge of the working group of legal and home affairs. So, Mr. Poms, welcome. I would like to open the floor for you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Vice President McGuinness, uh, dear colleagues. Having the four largest political groups represented in a debate about religion, Islam, equality, and human rights proves the political importance of the matter, especially at this precise moment. As you know, the EPP group is always interested and pleased to take part in initiatives concerning religion. Inside of our group, we have what we call the EPP Interreligious Dialogue, which regularly organizes conferences and different activities on interreligious issues. Examining the religious dimension of the biggest challenges that our European society is currently facing always uh, is very important, and it is also very necessary. We cannot ignore how religion plays an important role in the life of many citizens across the European Union. Only by having a constructive dialogue about different religions, not just Islam, we will be able to fight against extremism, violence, hate, and general religion stereotypes. The question about women's rights in Islam is without doubt a complex and a sensitive debate. I am not an expert in religion, neither in women issues, but I'm sure about what my common sense tells me. And what my common sense tells me the most of the time is let the men talk less on women issues and let the women talk by themselves. However, while the public debates about Muslim women and women's rights in Europe are allegedly about their autonomy and liberation, they are often the last to be consulted. To succeed in answering a question such as the title of this event, we need to have a consensus about our values and the standards that are irrevocable for us as European Union citizens. Therefore, we must keep promoting a culture of equal rights between men and women as one of our fundamental and non-negotiable European values. A mixing of religion and human rights, including equality of men and women, should be done in an honest and fair debate. If not, as I told last October, any religion will be at this point incompatible with human rights. Any religion, not only Islam. Therefore, I would like to underline again the importance of education. Education teaches values and principles. Education teaches equality between men and women in every single aspect of our lives and societies. Furthermore, education teaches people that the sacred texts are one thing, but there is also the interpretation done over those texts and could be done in two very different ways, with a balanced approach or with an extremist approach, fundamentalist and violent. What is clear is that religion shouldn't be used to enforce inequality, neither Islam nor other religions. What is also clear is that we will keep fighting against the violation of women's rights, no matter if it comes because a radical interpretation of religion or because sexism. I'm sure that this conference will significantly contribute to a better understanding of this topic, especially considering the high qualified speakers that we have today in the table. It is the best way to explore ideas for further actions and initiatives in this field, which are completely necessary. 
I thank again the, organizers, the organizers and participants, and I pass the floor to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pons. You said very uh, substantial things, so better understanding of this topic, and I hope that uh, all of us will contribute to this um, um, claim. First speaker about this subject will be Matty Haven, and she grew up as a Muslim. She's a Muslim woman, and uh, she will report from her point of view about women's rights and Islamic misconceptions and extremism. Matty is a policy and advocacy advisor on countering extremism under the name of Islam. She's a senior member of the International Organization to Preserve Human Rights, who is the one of the organizers of this gathering. She has been advocating against Islamic misconceptions and counteracting the abuse of Islam to control and suppress certain groups of society, in particular women and religious minorities. As a Muslim woman and human rights activist, her work highlights the principles of equality and tolerance contained within the Quran. Her efforts aim to empower other activists and policymakers to help create dynamic change in society by campaigning for equal rights and raising awareness of the teachings of the Quran. So, dear Matty, thank you for coming. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear Helmut Gawel, and thank you very much for everyone being here today and giving me this opportunity for all the MEPs here to uh, have this uh, time to speak. Um, yes, so I'm coming from a person as a brought up as a Muslim family. And as I was growing up, my experience of Islam that I was told is that it was a patriarchal religion because there was always more rights for men. And that was the way that I was told to be accepted. And it wasn't just the fact that what was my family, what was taught, it was around surrounding the areas of the communities, Muslim friends. It was really try to say, well, it is the way the religion and the practice is that a woman is valued as a half of a man. So I had a really conflicting issue with myself as someone who believed in human rights and believed in uh, the value of equality, how can I practice something that is not in line with my core inner belief? So the conflict was there and I started to search and ask you know, imams about the place of women. Why is it that you know, honor killing takes place or gen female genital mutation takes place or the right for a woman to divorce is less why is it there are certain practices that happens for women uh, and there's less rights for women? So this was the challenges and I wanted to find out the answers. So I started to search, ask different scholars, and what I found out, it was indirectly I was told you have to accept it and not question the Quran and not to go into yourself because you don't understand the Quran, so therefore you need to have our interpretation. So again, going back is what I was told is that my value as a human being was half of a value of my brother. That's what I was told. And I challenged that. I challenged my father. Why is it that we are living in the same society, uh, we're breathing the same thing, but he has got more rights than I have? And that was my father didn't have any explanation. He was told by somebody else. Because Quran is, you know, is in Arabic and you have to be very knowledgeable. So I took on the challenge myself and say, well, actually, I do want to believe that Islam is peaceful, but I need to know it for myself and I need to search the answers for myself. So I started gathering different books of the I started gathering different Qurans and I realized that there is so many different interpretations. And I realized the interpretations were based on the author. 
So what was said in the text, in the Quran, then there was what they thought it meant to be saying. So again, um, you know, my sources was giving me different information. So the more I researched, the more I went into it, and this is a religion that I was told that there is an, it is acceptable and it's normal to accept that fact that there, there is an imbalance in gender inequality, you know, that was acceptable. The more I researched the Quran, I realized actually there is no such a thing as imbalance in the teaching of the Quran. The more research I did, I realized that there is more equality that exists. However, it was conflicting to what was being practiced by certain groups. You know, I want to be very clear because this is not for every group, but what was said in the media, for example, um, the wearing of veil and hijab. The question comes, am I not a good Muslim because I'm not wearing a hijab? I could not find anywhere in the Quran states that a female needs to cover their hair with a hijab. I could not find that. There is a word of hijab uh, in Quran, I must say that, but it is actually a cover, a veil. The veil exists, but this veil is between this world and the next world. So it does talk about a veil, but it never stresses for any woman to wear a specific hair cover. So it actually empowered me, and it actually I found more, the more I researched, I found that the teaching of the Quran is very much totally compatible to today's society that we live in. It is compatible to modern society that we live in. The law of abrogation it exists in the Quran, meaning that when a verse is being said and the next verse, different time comes along, it can counter the previous verse. So it is very dynamic text. It is not a text that needs to be practiced as someone thinks it was done 1,400 years ago. It is very dynamic and and when we are talking about phrases, words, we need to understand not what the words means today, in today's language. I can tell you that due to the patriarchal way of certain societies with regards to the teachings of Islam, the words were being manipulated and used in a way in order to justify their actions of suppressing women in society. So I can tell you that certain words have been changed to modify the meanings to suit at the time of, and this has been passed on through generation to generation. So the more I understand is that what we need to do is try to distinguish between the misconception the misunderstanding of what the Quranic text says and actually try to look into it more deeper and say actually it is compatible but we need to distinguish what's practiced. For example, when someone practices an inequality with human rights, inequality with gender rights, and when you speak to them, they say it is part of my religious teaching. We need to understand is that part of someone's religious teaching or it's a cultural behavior that has been passed through generation to generation. So we need to really look into different. This is in my findings that I discovered. If there's more questions in question time, I could answer, but thank you very much. I think I want to summarize that. My main points that I'm making today is that one, we need to understand when we're talking about women's rights in Islam, is it compatible to today's modern society? Yes, it is compatible. It is dynamic. It is equal. There is no difference between male and female. And this is my final points for today. Thank you. Thank you, Matty, for this personal account, very clear. Um, I would like to welcome Julie Ward, who is sitting next to me on my right side. She's a Labour MEP for the northwest of England. She 
I learned that she's a writer, theater maker, and cultural activist who began her working life on the factory floor before becoming a community arts worker. Now she's a member of EP, Committees on Culture and Education, women, Women's Rights and Gender Equality and Regional Development. Julie is also a children's rights champion. She confounded the cross-party intergroup on children's rights and sat on the Labour Party's Children and Education Policy Commission. She is a board member of the European Internet Forum and a founding member of the European Caucus of Women in Parliaments. And the board is yours. Okay, thank you. I thought I would dedicate this session um, to my Muslim women friends, and I count Matty Heaven to be one of my newest Muslim women friends. But I wanted to remember while I'm here um, some really key people in my life. Naila Ashraf, who works for the Ministry of Justice in the UK and is uh, an activist with Stand Up to Racism. And Stand Up to Racism um, have been really active in the UK because of the increasing racism we sadly have in our country, but also very, very active in supporting the refugees, um, specifically the refugees who were in northern France, um, and uh, supported, in fact, a pink bus which was a bus of LGBTI activists that were supported to go to the refugee camps to support those mostly Muslim refugees. Because I, what I'm going to say isn't just about women's rights, it's about how women's rights defenders are also defending other people's rights too, because all our rights are under attack. Um, I also wanted to uh, dedicate this to my great friend Yasmin Dar who is Kashmiri and who took me to Kashmir where I met amazing women activists and student activists there. Um, and Yasmin works in a prison uh, delivering social education for people in Manchester, people who've really fallen through all the different social nets that there are. I also want to mention my great friend Sadia Habib who has a PhD from Goldsmiths University a PhD on intercultural dialogue and from whom I learn a great deal. And also my friend Aisha Mirza, who just won an, an award in the UK for her work with Women's Aid, which is an organization that fights against violence against women and girls. And also my friend uh, Saira Yassir Dean, I think, Dean, who um, uh, works for the uh, Foundation for Science and Technology and Citizenship and who have an absolutely amazing project called 1001 Inventions, which is the, a way of showing the great um, heritage, the cultural and scientific heritage um, of Islam. Um, so this, for me, this session is really for them too and for what they have taught me. The title of this event is intended to be provocative. We had a discussion about it. The question, is Islam compatible with women's rights? And the answer is an open, progressive, and multicultural society must be. And yes, of course it is. It is as compatible as any other religion. And I speak, some, I speak as somebody, I don't have a faith, so, you know, but I am the friend of many people in many different, um, from many different religious communities. Um, we live in a time today where the debate around Islam has become toxic as various extremist and violent interpretations of Islam are toxic. But, and however, we do not find ourselves asking whether Catholicism is compatible with women's rights or is Lutherism compatible with women's rights. When we have these debates, we should keep in mind that just a few hundred years ago, Christians were burning witches. And I'm from an area where many women were actually burned. Um, uh, Having this debate on Islam and gender equality is extremely important, but it must involve two distinct approaches dealing with two different sets of extremists. On the one hand, we must take on the prejudice and xenophobia of the far right, often also promoted by the centre-right and the media, that Islam or Muslim are dangerous and we must therefore stand up for diversity. 
On the other hand, working with Muslim communities and grassroots activists, this dialogue we're having on the interpretation of Islam and its religious texts. In both cases, we need to encourage people-to-people -people contact and direct debate. We need to strengthen and amplify the role of women and girls in that debate and to encourage young pe people to take the lead. And um, because I represent the northwest of England, which has a very large Muslim uh, diaspora community, um, I go to a lot of events with young people. And the, there's a wonderful school in my constituency um, for Muslim girls, and they are actually the, they are always the school that wins all the awards for all the academic um, uh, uh, challenges that are ever that are ever on the table. So, you know, they are doing very well. Thank you. Um, we need to invest more in civic education, however. I just talked about, about purely academic education there, but I'm a great promoter of intercultural dialogue and citizenship and informal education and lifelong learning. And we must invest more in civic education inside and outside the classroom. There must be more programs for all ages um, of all these different kinds of education in order to tackle these issues. And my report from 2016 uh, dealt specifically with the role of intercultural dialogue in diversity, education, and fundamental European values. Um, so if you're not aware of that report, I would ask you to look at it. It gives a policy framework um, that education ministers in 28 different member states should be taking on board. It says nothing that you wouldn't want in a civilized society. Now, I've already said that I've got broad experience of working with women from diverse Muslim, Muslim communities who stand up for a tolerant and open interpretation of Islam and Muslim secular culture. And the women that I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, most of them wear the hijab most of the time. Not all of them, but most of them most of the time. And I don't have a problem with that. Neither does my political group or the activists for human rights and women's rights and LGBTI rights that I work with back home. Uh, but I'm very active also in Turkish Kurdistan, and it's a great example there of how Muslim women are standing up for human rights, for their rights and for wider human rights. And I, last week I was in Kosovo where I met with Kosovo Albanian Muslim women who've survived a horrific war and they fight for justice and rec reconciliation. And in Israel and Palestine, I work with bereaved women on both sides who work for peace. And all of these women and the men who work with them present a vision of societies that overcome violent extremism through dialogue with women taking the lead. One final thing is just to um, point people towards the cultural diplomacy strategy that Federica Mojarini announced in April last year, which is very important for promoting the kind of dialogue and social change that I talk about in my report. Um, so we have to make that a global strategy, not just a European strategy. Thank you. Thank you for this appeal. Global strategy sounds good. Dear Julie, thank you very much. I have to my left side Jerry Campbell, who is a former Scotland Yard Detective Chief Superintendent. And he's a trustee of the Sharan Project and the founder of the Big Brother movement. Jerry has done extensive work alongside diverse communities and the police service in tackling all forms of hate crime, faith crime, violence towards women. Well, his efforts include dedicated leadership and service to combat social evils like honor-based abuse, forced marriage, and female genital mutilation. He continues to work with regional, national, and international governments like USA, Sweden, Denmark, India, Pakistan, and Australia to help bring about socio-political changes and influence gender equality and tolerance. Jerry, would you like to tell us more about it, please? Wow, first time. Uh, so, uh, massive thanks to my friends at uh, the International Organization uh, to Preserve uh, Human Rights. 
and my dear friend uh, Matty um, for, uh, for day two um, that I've had at the EU Parliament, so a, a massive thank you. Colleagues have talked already about, um, uh, about men. Men need to talk less and listen. Um, I agree with that. But there's also something about men need to talk uh, more around, uh, around the subjects. Uh, and for that, um, I, I, I will seek to talk more on it uh, just now. Because there's an absolute uh, need to uh, strengthen and amplify the role and voices that men and boys have in tackling gender, uh, gender inequality. The Big Brother movement is something uh, you'll hear towards the end of uh, this very short, well, shortish uh, presentation for me. As I signal to my friend in the corner. Um, so today's, uh, today's presentation uh, and today's event uh, was built around our women's rights in Islam compatible with modern society. But the stark reality of it is we've also got to be talking about our men's attitude to women and girls in Islam compatible with modern society. So are men's attitudes to women and girls compatible? That's the crux of what we need to talk about. That's the crux of why men and boys' voices and positive action needs to be, uh, needs to be amplified. So, in essence, I will dedicate my presentation today to the many young women, and men for that matter, who have been killed in the name of so-called honour. We absolutely must uh, honour their lives and learn from their deaths. Honour their lives and learn from their deaths. There's an image there of a young woman uh, from, a young girl, young woman from uh, the north of uh, the UK who was murdered by her parents. Prosecuting counsel in the presentation to the criminal courts talked about escape, submit or die. And escape, submit or die essentially was the stark choices open to Shafilia Ahmed and her two sisters. Sadly, Shafila died at the hands of her mother and her father. She was killed in the presence of her siblings. One sister escaped, and one sister submitted to the will of her parents, giving evidence in support of them at the criminal trial. But the stark reality of those three very simple words lies and be lies a massive uh, story because that is the stark reality of many young women uh, today living in developed countries. This is not something that happens over there somewhere. This is something happening on our doorsteps. Should we move on? And again, please. So there is something about the uh, honesty of um, the conversation. And there's a quick reminder there of some uh, UN general resolutions and um, what the convention, CEDAW, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, adopted in 1979. The stark reality of it is we have got to make sure, and our politicians have got to make sure, that this is not about window dressing. Because sitting behind these policies and sitting behind our expectations of the delivery of these policies are real people. And it's about the protection of, um, of real people. Custom, tradition, religious beliefs cannot be used as an excuse for avoiding the obligations to eliminate violence against women and girls. We can take that also to be mean gender-based violence. 
Okay, let's move on. So there's something about our understanding of what honour is. And using honour and seeing honour on a linear uh, continuum with shame. Honour in itself has got many real positive attributes to it. And character traits around integrity, good moral character, a sense of altruism. But of course there is a much more negative aspect connected to honour. And that much more negative aspect comes about when there's a need to defend um, that honour. When there's a need to protect it, if there's a perception of it being under attack. Start reality, honour defines a family's mindset, way of life, and lifestyle. There's something about the collective maintenance uh, of honour as well. And with the collective maintenance comes collective action to tackle those individuals who are seen to have dishonoured their families. Banaz Mahmoud, young Iraqi Kurdistani woman, kidnapped, abducted from her home address in southwest uh, London, January 2006, 23rd of January 2006, to be precise. She was deemed to be in an inappropriate relationship with another, with a Muslim man. Killed on the orders of a paternal uncle, her father, and other community members. Body found in a shallow grave in a year, rear yard in Birmingham to the north of uh, the UK. Let's move on, please. And again, keep going. My time is rapidly running out. Keep going. Okay, to gender inequality. So when we look at gender inequality across the board on the subjects that I particularly look at, honour-based abuse, forced marriage, female genital mutilation, breast ironing, and the many array of harmful cultural but outdated uh, practices. The stark re reality of it is that gender-based abuse and violence is rooted in social um, and gender inequality and discrimination. It is derived from cultural and outdated harmful cultural practices, which are man-made. They are man-made, therefore they can be changed by man. It is about men exercise power and control over women and girls to control their sexuality and their sexual autonomy. If you look at some of the issues attributed and connected to female genital mutilation, it is about virginity, purity, marriageability and fidelity. It is about control of sexuality and sexual autonomy. The wider reaches of honour-based abuse is about the perpetration of that abuse because of religious misinterpretation, often seen as a motivation for the perpetration of honour-based abuse. The stark reality of it is that honour-based abuse is about the A to Z, the depth and breadth of violent crime affected and perpetrated against women and girls. But reach back again at the case of Banaz Mahmoud. We're not talking about one, two, three, four people who were perpetrating against, uh, crimes against Banaz. There were many, many men and boys involved in the offending against that one uh, young woman. The scale of offending. UN will say there's something like 5,000 to 20,000 honour killings every year. You'll recognise there's a massive gulf in those figures. 5 to 20,000. The stark reality of it is there are many more victims of, uh, of honour killings. 
the 200 million uh, women and girls who undergo FGM every year. The stark reality of that, given the birth rate of girls throughout the world, that figure of 200 million is escalating very fast. That figure of 200 million by 2030 will be 300 million, if not before. Let's move on again, please. The scale of, the global scale then of forced marriage. 15 million girls are married before the age of 18. Many more are married under the age of 15 with the health and life-threatening health um, issues associated with, uh, with that. So tackling gender inequality then. For me, there's four uh, points to that then. The four points to are around education, employment, empowerment equals equality, equals the empowerment to challenge discrimination, to challenge uh, inequality. You go to the slide on um, community-driven solutions, the one after that, please. So for me, there's something about community-driven solutions. Given the deeply ingrained cultural nature of the offending, communities have got to want to change. No numbers of laws and prosecutions and court cases in isolation are going to end on a based abuse in a sustainable way. Communities have got to want to change. With that in mind then, the uh, principal perpetrators of honour-based abuse are men. Therefore, men have got a fundamental role in eradicating uh, gender-based um, gender violence. We have got to strengthen and amplify the voices of men and boys to challenge gender inequality to challenge other men who practice on a best abuse, forced marriage, domestic abuse. Many people will talk about the role of women in female genital mutilation, that it's matriarchal driven. Yes, it is. However, if men continue to select partners of choice who have, all, who have and only partners and female life partners of choice who have undergone FGM, Families are going to continue to ensure that the girls undergo FGM. So the role of men in this is absolutely fundamental. One more slide, if I may, Chair. With that, then, is the birth of uh, what I call and what we call uh, from my uh, friends as we operate across, um, across Africa and elsewhere, is the, uh, the birth of something called the Big Brother Movement. The Big Brother movement, our mission is around how we support what we call the Big Sister movement and other national and international stakeholders in their commitment to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, including FGM, gender-based violence, honour-based violence and other harmful practices inflicted on uh, women and girls. With the aspirations to the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals by um, 2020. So I would absolutely encourage, and this is not just about men and boys from um, so-called affected uh, communities. This is about men and boys from a range of different diverse cultural backgrounds coming together with women to tackle gender-based abuse. I would actively encourage all the uh, men in the room to join uh, the Big Brother movement. Membership is free of charge, um, and uh, I'll see you after. Thank you very so much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I would like to welcome Mrs. MEP Beatrice Becerra. Thank you for coming. Um, for those who don't know much about Mrs. Becerra, who is a member of the European Parliament, she's the Vice Chair for the European Parliament's Subcommittee on Human Rights. And she graduated industrial uh, psychology and completed her education with an MBA and several postgrads in marketing management, human resources, and nonprofit organizations. 
She developed her professional career in the sphere of marketing and communication during more than 20 years as executive manager in multinational companies such as CBS, Paramount, Universal, Disney, and Sony. She's also a novelist, having written and published three novels, recently has launched AWARE, Alliance of Women Against Radicalization and Extremism, a European network of municipalities, think tanks, and political leaders fighting against radicalization and extremism through the exchanges of best practices and information. Please let's know about, more about this. Thank you very much, Helmut. I'm deeply honored to be part of this debate today that I find more than timely and necessary. It is crucial for us in Europe and definitely for the future of peace and global governance. And if you allow me, I will be kind of incorrect today. Maybe simple, perhaps naive. But this is my in-depth analysis of this reality and my proposal to move forward. The world is and will become more and more globalized, multicultural, and multifocal. But this does not ensure tolerance or peace. Let's start by clarifying what is Islam. Islam is a religion, right? It is not a race or a single culture. It is not, not a governmental model, or is it? It's not, right? It is the fastest growing and second religion with most, most followers after Christianity called Muslims. And the estimations say that only a 15% of Muslims are Arabs. The Ummah is like a commonwealth of believers, divided in multiple branches and interpretations. The most important are Sunni and Shia, which arise after Mahoma's death. These groups separate in further branches, such as Wahhabism, which has a stricter interpretation of Sharia law, and it's applied in Saudi Arabia. And for me, this is precisely where the main problem is. The key resides in the interpretation of the Quran. The root of the issue is in the free interpretation that each individual, each community, makes of the Quran. There is no unified version, and the danger comes from radical, accepted interpretations that expand relentlessly. Therefore, the questions I think we should ask ourselves are, why should the Quran require an interpretation in 2017? Does it mean that Muslim, adult Muslims, are not able to read and understand a holy book by themselves? Does Islam consider that all human beings, men and women, are equal before the law and have the same universal rights? And my third question, why is there no Bulgata for the Quran as it was for the Bible in the fourth century? Could there be a unified Islamic authority that could validate it? Would there be women on that authority? If a unique version of the Quran would be worldwide established, respecting these two basic premises that I, I said, the multiple threats related to interpretations would be deactivated. In the meanwhile, there are some positive advances that have been made by the Islamic world, which we, I think, should embrace with optimism, such as the Marrakech Declaration. On January 2016, Muslim academics and intellectuals from around the world came together in Marrakech, and it was declared that the Medina Charter, dated from the 7th century, is the basis to guarantee human and civil rights in modern Muslim countries, as it establishes the constitutional principles of citizenship, such as justice and equality before the law. The Declaration stipulates that the Medina Charter and the UN Declaration of Human Rights are in harmony. It also urges the Muslim educational institutions and authorities to conduct a courageous review of educational curricula that addresses honestly and effectively any material that instigates aggression and extremism. It is absolutely essential that young people recognize the real message of Islam and are not lured by radical and extremist messages, which is Islam for their own, their own selfish and power center purposes. Empowering the individual capability to understand and to observe a religion with no mediation or mentoring needed. 
with no interpretation. We need Muslim leaders, of course, men and women, who promote a modern and unified version of the Quran and therefore of the Islam, of the true Islam, that expressly recognizes the principle of equality for all human beings. There are no women's rights in Islam or in Christianity or in Buddhism. Women's rights are human rights and human rights are the universal rights of human, being, human beings. The most harmful threat comes from the Muslim rise of radical interpretation. Wahhabism, a form of Islam practiced in Saudi Arabia, clearly does not respect human women's rights. Before. Therefore, it's clearly not compatible with a modern society, with a rule of law society, with a democratic society. This is the use of Islam for power purposes. The European Parliament has repeatedly identified Wahhabism as the main source of global terrorism. It is against women's rights, but also against human rights, against freedom, or against peace. They have fed the Islam of fascists that we, together with moderate and modern Muslims, have to combat by all means. We hate what we ignore. These words are supposedly, were supposedly mentioned by Ali ibn Abu Talib, cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. It is the lack of knowledge what generates hate. We must fight to give ourselves the right tools to expand common values, and we need a truthful, single, modern version of the Quran, the holy book that sustains Islam. And we, together, can defeat hate and intolerance. So let's make it real, because it is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Becerra. Our last speaker before we open the round for questions and answers. I hope a lot of questions have arisen in your minds and you might have noted them. I would like to invite Dr. Said Mustafa Azmayesh to give us some enlightenment. As uh, you quoted, we hate what we ignore, so that this has no chance. I would like to invite Dr. Said Mustafa Azmesh to enlighten us about the Quran. He's the founder of the International Organization to Preserve Human Rights, Yoffer, who is co-organizer of this event, and author of the book, New Researches on the Quran, uh, which is uh, into the depth research about Quran and has a lot of new findings, which is being actually discussed in academic, academic circles right now. Dr. Azmaesh, is a researcher in the fields of law and theology, a jurist, scholar, and expert on Islamic misconceptions and Quranic misinterpretations. Dr. Azmaesh studied theology at the Sorbonne, history of law at the Pantheon in Paris, and comparative science of Islam and Christianity at the University of Lyon. He holds two doctorates as a result of his studies and is a passionate contributor towards education and society. He is known for his research in the field of Islam, Gnosticism and Christianity and for his advocacy for human rights internationally. His most notable efforts have been the push for reform within fundamentalist regimes towards the adherence of human rights values. He has done exemplary work to counteract the increasing violent extremism taking place under the pretext of Islam in our society, meaning Europe. So please, Dr. Azmaish, tell us more. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to precise one thing which is very, very important. I think that we must differentiate between the violence hidden behind the name of Islam or religion and the teachings of the Quran. It means that religious violence doesn't exist at all. What exists is violence created by man and hiding it under the name of a religion in order to give it the legitimacy. It is a very important point. 
And the second point is that from the beginning, we are confronted with this problem in the life period of Prophet Muhammad, when he was alive between his community, two different opposite vers version of Islam were born in the city of Medina as a thesis and antithesis of Islam. But both of them under the name of Islam. It means that Quran itself is based on gender equality and gender neutrality, absolutely. And during the question and answer, I will develop more this principle in the Quran. But the place that Prophet Muhammad started to propagate the teachings of the Quran in the peninsula of Arabia, the Bedouin were too much attached to their tribal traditions, and they didn't want at all to change their world vision. It is written clearly in the Quran, Lan no'menu bahada, we don't believe to your book. Bring another one or change the content of this book. So from the beginning, they resisted in front of the teachings of the Quran and rejecting totally the appeals of Prophet Muhammad. And they forced a lot of martial confrontation against Muhammad and his community. But finally, after the victorious entrance of Prophet Muhammad and his companion inside of the city of Mecca, the majority of those Bedouin, they accepted to convert verbally to this religion which is named Islam. But they remained attached to their tribal tradition. And from that moment they started not to reject openly the teachings of the Quran, but they accepted the Quran according to their own interpretations. So they built the mosques in order to lead the prayer and in order to preach the audience and in order to brainwash the mind of the audience and to put the tribal tradition in the backside of the mind of all of them, this time under the name of Islam. So about this group of people, the half of the verses of the Quran, which are revealed to Prophet Muhammad after settling down in Medina, are talking. These are the group which are named by the Quran the false Muslim, the hypocrite people, whose tongue talks about Islam, whose heart remained attached to the tribal traditions. And tribal traditions was based on patriarchal behavior. And they imposed this vision on the Islam and this vision of this group of people who took power after the apparition of Umayyad dynasty inside of the history under the name of Islam. So it's a matter that people, they don't respect the right of women in the society. But worse than this is that they do as a legitimate action because they relate their tendency to Islam. And they pretend we are not respectful equally to the right of women because our religion dictates us to us. This is the problem. So there are a lot of things which are totally absent in the Quran and the people they make their own religion upon them. And there are a lot of teachings in the Quran that people, they don't pay attention. For example, 
there are 310 verses of the Quran consecrated of the space and skies and cosmos and stars and sun and moon and etc. It is written, Avalam yaru ila sama fawghahum Why they don't look at the sky and space? How we created it beautifully, full of beauty. And any verse about imposed hijab exists in the Quran. And people, they make the whole Islamic religion upon this principle. So why? It doesn't come from Islam. It doesn't come from the Quran or from the Quranic teachings. But it is not a new problem of today. It is a very old problem, as old as the apparition of the Quran, the apparition of Islam. It is very, very, very old problem. So it is necessary in this modern time, in this modern society, to talk about, to discover about the importance of the place of the social contracts inside of the teachings of the Quran. There is a lot to say, but after I will explain, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Azmaish, for this introduction into uh, the contents of your book and your thesis about the two versions of Islam. So before Beatrice is going to give her conclusion, I would like to thank the International Organization to Preserve Human Rights um, for organization to, to, together with uh, Julie Ward and um, Mr. Pons, who left the um, board, and Mrs. Beatrice Beras. Uh, for organizing this event. I think this event needs certainly more and uh, in, into the depths, as we see, the time was too short to have all of your uh, questions answered. Thank you for coming. Please, Beatrice, give us your conclusion. I will be very brief. Uh, for me, there are some, some conclusions on that, uh, far beyond those deep um, studies and, and uh, you know, uh, details that need to be taken into account. But the, the first one for me uh, is that there is a big space for misinterpretation of the Islam, of the Quran, because interpretation is needed. So the only way to end with misinterpretation is to end with interpretation needed. Empowering individuals, the Muslims, the Islamic people, as uh, with, the, with the power and the competence to understand perfectly what the Quran says and how is the, the, the way to live the religion. Uh, there is no updated, modern, unique, single, worldwide accepted version of the Quran, qualified and certified by uh, Islamic authority. And I think we can do it because we can uh, agree on that. I think this is the way to, to have something operational, something that, that works for everybody. And I think also that there is a way open to that crossroad, uh, crossroad between the human rights, rule of law, democracy, uh, fundamental rights, citizenship, open by the uh, Medina, the, the, the Marrakech Declaration and, and the Medina empowering. Because this is something that has to be recognized for, century, for centuries uh, by all the Muslim community. And the, the good things that are inside are, are um, I would say, are essential for now to, to have a common ground for consensus. And this is the way where the intersection can be met. And, and I would say that uh, we should all welcome this kind of initiatives and, uh, and also give the, the right acknowledgement, awareness, and coverage to this kind of initiatives, because we are not given them. And we need more people like, forgive me for my pronunciation, I would like to, to say the, the name of, of this, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdallah bin Baya of Abu Dhabi. <laughs> I think this is the kind of people we need. And we need also women leaders, because I assume there are women leaders in, in the Muslim community, are there? So we need to have that kind of balanced 
powerful community. Based on that, because it's, uh, we, we cannot afford to get rid of this uh, inheritance, because there is the, the right uh, pillars of that are inside this. And this is the way we all have to fight against that, uh, that is what is harmful to our uh, way of living together. So thank you very much.